So one of the laws of capitalist motion and development is this inexorable expansion. And that means expansion into an expropriation of the third world. A process that's been going on for about 400 years, perpetrated by the Portuguese, the Spaniards, the Dutch, the Belgians, the French, the English, and most recently, most successfully, most impressively, by the Americans. That is the American, that is by the ruling classes of these countries, not by the ordinary people. The ordinary people simply paid the costs of empire. The ordinary people simply sent their sons off to die on the plains of India or in the jungles of um, the Congo or uh, in Latin America, wherever else. But that expropriation of the third world has been going on for 400 years, brings us to another revelation, namely that the third world is not poor. You don't go to poor countries to make money. There are very few poor countries in this world. Most countries are rich. The Philippines are rich. Brazil is rich. Mexico is rich. Chile is rich. Only the people are poor. But there's billions to be made there, to be carved out and to be taken. There's been billions for 400 years. The capitalist European and North American powers have carved out and taken the timber, the flax, the hemp, the cocoa, the rum, the tin, the copper, the iron, the rubber, the bauxite, the slaves, and the cheap labor. They have taken out of these countries. These countries are not underdeveloped. They're overexploited. One of the countries that had a great deal of Western capital in it was Tsarist Russia, mostly English, French, some German, some American, including one Herbert Hoover, who with Leslie Urquhart, famous British millionaire, owned the Russo-Asiatic Corporation, which if the Russian Revolution hadn't happened, Herbert Hoover would have been one of the richest men in the world. And years later, when he was president of the United States in 1931, when one third of this country was unemployed, when people didn't have enough to eat, when people were driven to the edge of desperation, President Herbert Hoover said to the San Francisco Examiner, he said, my greatest ambition in life is to see the overthrow of Bolshevism in Russia. There came with the Russian Revolution a break in the fabric of international capitalist history. There now was a country where the unwashed, where the workers of Petrograd and Moscow were actually taking over, where they were actually taking over the land, the labor, the technology, and the resources of their country, where communists were coming in to power. And there's a remarkable correspondence between Secretary of State Lansing and President Woodrow Wilson, in which Lansing says, the Bolsheviks are wanting in political virtue. They would preach to the ordinary man that he might elevate himself through political means rather than by dint of hard work. This would be a most unfortunate example to the common man in our country and other countries. They understood what was the threat. The Americans themselves, the American ruling class, had very little cap, didn't have all that much. I told you about Hoover and a few other speculators, other people like that. Um, but they joined in with 14 other nations to invade the Soviet Union to overthrow the socialist government that had just been put in um, after the Tsar was overthrown. That process of invading a revolutionary country is still happening before our eyes. If you want to understand those years after the Russian Revolution, just look at what's going on in Nicaragua. Invasion, either by directly with troops from your own country, or by using surrogate troops, and they use the white armies and the white generals, um, the white guard armies. Embargoes, isolation, withholding food supplies, sabotage, encirclement, uh, refusing diplomatic recognition, these are, the, these are the methods that are used, and these are the methods, time-honored methods, that are, that are being used right now by Reagan against another revolutionary government, which is Nicaragua.